Thanks. I think with that, we'll turn on, we'll uh, end the, this section of the podcast and turn to the uh, next section. But yeah, thank you guys both for your thoughts on that. That was a, it was a really a substantive discussion. Um, all right. So this more, uh, this presentation section of the podcast is going to be on an, the introduction to an introduction to the Gelasian diarchy. Um, which is the church's teaching on the relationship between church and state. Um, all right. Let me see if I can do justice to, so I'm going to be basically uh, shamelessly plagiarizing an article made uh, written by uh, Edmund Waldstein uh, of the Order of the Cistercians um, on this. So uh, definitely we'll link that in the, the uh, description below and Definitely uh, give 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 a shout out to him and the Josias. Would highly recommend that website. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna. I did add some more th- things of my own and stuff. So uh, hopefully this will be comprehensible. All right. So if we go back to antiquity, so before considering Catholic teaching on this topic, what did the ancients think of uh, think the end of of man was like the temporal end? So if we look at Aristotle, um, just because he's obviously greater than all the other ancient philosophers, um, he says that uh, there must be some final end for which all other ends meet up. Um, So like if you're driving a car, like the end of driving a car isn't to drive the car. Like you're not just driving, you're trying to get somewhere. And that is the (laughs) final end. Um, Yeah, so... um, and then Aristotle says, man is a political animal. Um, and, then he, and then he goes on to claim, for even if the, the end is the same for a single man and for a state, that of the state seems at all events something greater and more complete. So what he's saying is, is that man's temporal ends for which he was made is to be found um, among other people in, in his society. Um, that... Uh, and this this sort of idea is called the common good. So, what is a common good? People usually think of of like economic goods as being uh, a zero sum game. Like you can't have an ice like if a boy has an ice cream cone, there's only so much of that ice cream cone that can go around. Like you can't make there's there's no way to like multiply it so that more people can enjoy it. But something like the sun would be a common good because your enjoyment of the sun does not take away from the enjoyment of other people's uh, other people of the sun. Um, so the sun would be something like a common good. And this is Aristotle's idea of the state as well, that the state would be a sort of common good for the people and would have things like, for example, install streetlights and roads, your use of the road doesn't impede anybody else's use of the road or your enjoyment of lighting doesn't improve, doesn't intrude upon anybody else's uh, enjoyment of the lighting. So that all makes sense. And it, and it makes sense that, that humans good is to be, that our end is, is to be found in something outside of ourselves. Um, but when we examine Christianity, this, it sort of seems to contradict this because this is purely like a temporal view of how things should be. Um, according to Aristotle. However, in Christianity, we see that salvation from this valley of tears is is paramount. Um, and then according to Waldstein, the teaching of the, the of Christianity on this is, uh, the, uh, in terms of the temporal and spiritual realms, this is what he says. The question of the relation of spiritual to temporal power is intimately connected to the question of the relation, relation between nature and grace. Christianity is able to distinguish between the two powers because it is a religion of grace, which does not destroy the order of nature, but presupposes, elevates, and perfects it. So we can see that even though Christianity has a spiritual end and not necessarily a temporal one, it, it's still, the temporal end is actually still necessary for the, for the um, completion of the spiritual end. Um, and so once again, that, that temporal end almost becomes like, is not the final end, but becomes like sort of an immediate end to the spiritual 
spiritual end, like I was talking about in terms of driving the car, like that, that temporal end of men living in a society through virtue is the driving of the car towards the end, the spiritual end of heaven. Um, thus, Aristotle's account of Christianity does not destroy um, Aristotle's, but rather perfects it. Um, all right, so let's look at look at this in a specifically Catholic context, though. We have an idea that the spiritual end is, is that the temporal end is supposed to be integrated in some way with the spiritual end, but not exactly how. So the Catholic teaching on this goes all the way back to the early 490s um, in a letter that Pope Gelasius I wrote to the Emperor Anastasius. In this letter, Pope Gelasius famously says, there are two August emperor by which this world is chiefly ruled, namely the sacred authority of the priests and the royal power. Of these, that of the priests is weightier since they have to render an account for even the kings of men in the divine judgment. You are also aware, most clement son, that while you are permitted honorably to rule over humankind, yet in divine matters you bend your neck devotedly to the bishops and await from them the means of your salvation. In the reception and proper disposition of the heavenly sacraments, you recognize that you should be subordinate rather than superior to the religious order, and that in these things you depend on their judgment rather than wish to bend them to your will. So let me just read the last part again, because that's pretty bold. Um, in the reception and proper disposition of the heavenly sacraments, you recognize that you should be subordinate rather than superior to the religious order, and that in these things you depend on their judgment rather than wish to bend them to your will. So this nature of grace um, duality, in this nature of grace duality, we see that the temporal needs to be subordinate to the spiritual. Um, and then unpacking this, Edmund Waldstein, the author of this article, argues that this diarchy, this is a diarchy, um, i.e. the uniqueness of the role of the state and of the church, needs to be found in scripture when Christ commands to Caesar, to, to the Pharisees, to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to render unto God the things that are God, God's. So let's go back to Gelasius' quote really quick and just unpack what diarchy means, because it's kind of a... Uh, it's definitely, it's probably a new term for most people. So it's a um, Catholic teaching on this point uh, has, uh, um, teaches that there's a diarchy between church and state and not a monarchy. So a monarchy, mon, is the, the root for one in Latin. It's something like, it's uh, based off of, I don't remember what the full word is, but then the die on the diarchy the die means two. Um, and it's there's two, as Julius said, there are two by which this world is chiefly ruled. There are two, the spiritual and temporal, um, meaning that each derives their power immediately from God rather than the temporal having its power only through the spiritual. So, but even though the temporal power is in a way like independent from the spiritual power, this its power is only still only legitimate if it submits to the spiritual. Um, and this is what Waldstein says. And yet the diarchical element derived from Gelasius was always preserved. At times the medieval Pope seemed to deny the Gelasian teaching by saying that the temporal power is derived not immediately from God, but rather immediately through the spiritual power. A careful reading, however, shows that this is not the case. The temporal power is derived from God however, can only have legitimacy if it submits itself to the spiritual power, which has carried the final end. So he's echoing what Gelasius said, that you, the, spirit, the temporal power has to subordinate itself to the spiritual. Um, all right. Give me a second here. All right. So a question that immediately comes to mind here. Why in the world would God establish two powers here? Why would he have a, make a diarchy instead of a monarchy? Um, well, we saw earlier that grace perfects nature and that nature is incapable of reaching the spiritual end of man, which is according to St. Thomas, the beatific vision of God in the next life. So that end is only achievable in the next life. So it makes sense then that the church should govern over matters pertaining to the salvation of souls. But why then shouldn't the church govern over temporal things as well? In another text by Pope Gelasius I, called Tractate 
poor, we see this diarchy of the spiritual and the temporal exists because of sin. Because of sin and human pride, as Gelasius says, it is necessary for the spiritual power to give up care of earthly matters to the temporal power. And that is why it is taught that those warring for spiritual things should not be entangled with secular things. And we see this in Christ's rebuke of Peter. Those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. The flip side of this then also, though, is that without the effects of sin, there would be no need to separate the spiritual and temporal power, and thus this, the spiritual power would reign supreme in a mono, more monarchical sense than a diarchical sense. Um, all right, so I'm just going to stop there. The rest of what I have is the Pope's just confirmed this teaching. Um, and yeah, I'm, I am sorry if that was slightly confusing or more than slightly confu confusing. But uh, what do you guys think on the presentation? You can disagree with how I framed it, I guess, um, having read the article yourselves. Mm. I can go. Would you like to begin, Jacob? Well, I, I, I do have some questions with regard to um, the Gelasian diarchy as it relates to later medieval papal teaching. Um, uh, for, for example, Unam Sanctam and Dictatus Pape um, in the opposite order because Dictatus Pape was, was written before. But anyway, um, so, so how, how, how does the, the development of the doctrine of, of, you know, the, the Petrine office work in, in this context? Because on one hand, we have the, the early teaching, uh, or the earlier teaching of Pope Gelasius, where we, we do have the, the, the diarchy. Um, and then later on, um, with, um, St. Peter Damien, um, we have the investiture controversy, um, and St. Peter Damien begins appealing to, to the Holy Roman Emperor and explaining that, yes, there are two swords, but the, 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 the spiritual and the temporal, but the temporal is handed to the temporal power by the spiritual power. And then in Dictatus Pape, um, we get a... Uh, which is written around that time in, in 1075, um, we get um, the foundation of the idea of Caesar or papism. So again, the superiority of the Pope over, over the emperor um, and that, that the, the, the temporal comes, the temporal power stems from the spiritual power. It, it, it is necessary to get the approval of the Pope, um, not only for the, the investiture of bishops, but also for the anointing and crowning of, of temporal kings, uh, which was previously considered to be the, the um, prerogative of, of the emperor. Um, and then, of course, Unam Sanctum, we, we sort of see a confirmation of that. So I, I was just wondering how, how we, we, we look at this and we sort of reconcile this transition in light of the magisterium of the church. Right. So that was what I was going to get into uh, after that short explanation. But I can I can read the um, the words from when I'm selling down that you were uh, referencing. Um, this is what po this is from Pope Boniface the Eighth, and I think you can correct me if I'm wrong. 1302 is when it was written. 1301, something like that. Something like that. Beginning of the 14th century. Yeah. Uh, so. This is like, this is, it's a very short encyclical, and this is sort of the heart of it. Uh, he says, both therefore are in the power of the church, that is to say, the spiritual and the material sword. But the former is to be administered for the church, but the latter by the church. The former in the hands of the priest, the latter by the hands of kings and soldiers, but at the will and sufferance of the priest. However, one sword ought to be subordinated to the other, and temporal authority subjected to spiritual power. So he's saying that this still um, echoes the teaching of the Gelasian diarchy because the, the temporal sword is wielded um, by the hands of the kings and uh, by the hands of kings and soldiers, but it's wielded for the church. 
So we see this that the that the sword, there's two swords that are given, one to the church, one to the temporal power, but the temporal power has to even though it gets to wield that sword, it has to wield it in, in subordination to the um, spiritual power. So that still preserves the Gelasian teaching that um, the temporal and the spiritual both get their power immediately from God rather than the temporal getting their power immediately through the spiritual. Once again, as I mentioned before, the temporal power has is its use of the sword is only legitimate if it if it administers it for the church, as Pope Boniface VIII says, does that answer or mostly answer the question? I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think later we're gonna we're we're definitely gonna go over the um, what the medieval popes say, and I think we're also gonna go over in that article uh, the Augustinian uh, view, the more Augustinian view, and the Whig Thomism view. That are sort of uh, contrary to inter the integralist view, the Gelasian hierarchy, um, just so we can sort of see by uh, see by contradiction, like more clearly what integralism is. Um, you know, it also be nice to uh, look at Saint Bellarmine in that as well. Oh, okay. Um, do you know he uh, he writes pretty extensively um, about different forms of government. Well, I don't know. So he writes a good bit about uh, different forms of government. Okay, can you guys uh, post the any sources? Because uh, I have Pope Boniface VIII, um, but I don't think I have Saint Peter Damien or uh, what were the other. Other popes, you, or what were some of the popes you mentioned, Jacob? Uh, there is also a document that wasn't published. It was more of like a note. It's called Dictatus Pape, um, and it was written by Gregory the Seventh. Oh, is that Gregory the Great? I don't think so. Oh no, okay. No, uh, Gregory the Great is uh, Gregory the First. Gregory the First, okay. Um, displaying my amazing lack, amazing lack of uh, amazing church knowledge here, and then William, you said Saint Robert Bellarmine, so Saint Peter Damien, yeah, Gregory the Seventh, and then Saint Robert Bellarmine. Okay, I'll have to take a look at those and uh, weave those into the the uh, the the next one. Um, so one other point that I that I wanted to make, which is very important here. Uh, in terms of like the this not being a monarchy, this only has to do with the relationship between the church and state. This doesn't have to do with the composition of the state itself. So this is not saying that the state itself needs to be a diarchy. No, like um, ideally the state itself would be a monarchy, actually. Um, it's just that in the relationship between church and state, there, it's a diarchy. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. It, there's also, you know, democracy and other forms of government are also allowed. Um, but I think monarchism is the the ideal, obviously, maybe not attainable in certain cases, but certainly the ideal uh, composition for the temporal uh, state. Uh, so I just wanted to make that that part clear, too. Um, Okay. Do I guess? Uh, yeah, I guess we can. I was uh, thinking maybe we could like do some mock objections and respond to them. But I think it'd be better if we waited until discussing the um, other points of view that are post integralism, because then we can really get into it there. Um, so unless mm -hmm. people have any other comments or questions or anything like or suggestions or anything like that. Um, yeah, I guess now would be the now would be the time. Yeah, I, I'd like to to make the suggestion that we look a little deeper into sort of the role of the Pope in crowning kings in the Middle Ages, because, like I said, originally the it, it was believed that all temporal rulers were answerable to the emperor, um, and were also 
who who could be elevated to to the position of, of kingship was very much a, a a prerogative of of the the Holy Roman Emperor. Um, but later on, around the time of, of the investiture controversy, we see one kingdom after another flipping out from underneath the, the, the influence and the say-so of the Holy Roman Emperor and simply bypassing him and, and asking the Pope for a blessing for a coronation. Um, and that seems to that, that, that seems to be sort of a, a usurpation of, of the imperial prerogatives um, within the Gelasian framework.